we've been doing it all wrong. At least I know I have. But I think it's safe to say that everybody here in this audience right now, and even those of you watching at home, are looking for inspiration. I mean, that's why we're here. That's what Ted is awesome at. My fellow speakers have already proved that this morning. But I personally feel that it's not inspiration we should be looking for at all, but rather how to inspire. The ability to inspire others. That is what I truly think we should be trying to figure out. Because it's in that act of pushing friends, families, strangers to new heights that we can reach new peaks ourselves. And I know what you're all thinking. You're thinking, how can I inspire? And let me tell you something. If I can do it, a slightly older, follically challenged Canadian from the middle of nowhere, and I'm talking the middle of the Canadian wilderness nowhere, then you can too, I promise. So if you can stay with me for 10 minutes, you are going to leave here not only with the ability to inspire the next person you meet, but the person sitting next to you. Before we get to that, we need to talk about three very important things. We need to talk about a school teacher from California named Harry. Why I believe that random acts of kindness are a complete waste of time. <laughs> it's not what you think. And this gentleman, this gentleman right here, he has taught me every single thing I need to know about what I'll be teaching you today. And I have never met this man. I've never exchanged a word with him, not a text, <laughs> not an email. I know virtually nothing about him, but he's holding something that I made specifically, not randomly, for him. I don't even know his name. My name, however, is Jamie D. Grant. <laughs> and I'd like to tell you a story. Even though I'm currently a paramedic, writer, artist, and magician, I used to be a bike messenger. And bike messaging was the perfect place to learn all those other things. I gave CPR to a man on the street who lived. I wrote my first article while on a bike. And it was the perfect place to learn magic. I mean, you're riding up and down elevators all day by yourself, surrounded in mirrors. It was perfect. <laughs> and it was a magic trick that brought me here to this stage. I was doing a delivery, and the CEO of some corporation invited me into his office. He was a magic fan. I think I showed him something. But he had something that amazed me. On his desk, he had an impossible object. It was a ship in a bottle. And I loved this thing. I, I was amazed by it. I just, I just couldn't believe it. So like any of you, immediately after work, I went home and started looking on the internet. And that's where I came across this man. Harry Yang was a school teacher in California. Not only was he a teacher, preacher, and brilliant thinker, but he was also not the grandfather of impossible objects, but as a great friend described him to me, he was the godfather. <laughs> Ever since bottles have been around, artists have been putting things in them that apparently shouldn't fit. Ships, intricately carved shapes of wood, apples, but Harry, Harry changed the game. He put scissors, <laughs> shoes, tennis balls in bottles. And then one picture I came across, I thought I saw a deck of cards. But the deck of cards didn't look to me like it was in the cellophane. And I became obsessed with that idea. Imagine a sealed deck of cards in the cellophane with the seal intact inside an unaltered glass bottle. If I could do that. And it's important to say that I didn't want to copy Harry. What he did was, is an inspiration. I wanted to make something with my own voice. Something all my own, something different. And I became obsessed with this idea. And I even went so far as to make sure no other impossible object artists were using square glass milk bottles. That would be my trademark, and I got lucky. 
Because in Vancouver, where I'm from, there was a dairy that still uses square glass milk bottles. Now, if only I could get this inside. Like any of you, I went home after work and I started drinking gallon after gallon of chocolate milk. <laughs> Tons of the stuff. I was spending whole paychecks on chocolate milk because the rules clearly state you cannot alter the glass. This had to go in. Failure after failure trying to make it work. And then one day, one day I'm riding my bike. And that word came to me, that magic word that has changed so many lives. Maybe. Maybe. And I went home, and I made 17 perfect mistakes. Each one leading me to a solution that would change my life. I did it. Woo! I did it. I put a sealed deck of cards inside an unaltered glass milk bottle. Oh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> like any great art, because now I'm a great artist, it needed to have a name. And I don't believe in negativity. I've never, even since I was a kid, I never believed in negativity. And I don't even like the words impossible bottle. So I called it the anything is possible bottle. I mean, if I could do this, what can all of you do? And I started selling them. I started selling them online for 100 bucks a piece because of the time it took. And it took off. It really struck a chord. I started selling them all over the world to celebrities and collectors alike. It changed my life. Okay, fast forward a few years, 2010, three and a half years ago. A great friend of mine, Duncan, and I would go and see a movie called Exit Through the Gift Shop. And this movie, as we all know, is now about an epically famous street artist named Banksy. And Banksy uses the street as his canvas. And I've been a fan of art ever since I was a kid, but I can't draw or paint to save my life. My stick figures do not look like stick figures. But I came out of this movie with such a desire to take part. I just wanted to be a part so badly. But I can't draw. So I'm sitting at home lamenting my life, looking at my own artwork, hoping for inspiration, when I realize, wait a minute, what if I left the anything is possible bottle on the street? That could be my claim to street art. But if I did that, I would face two very distinct challenges. Number one, it wouldn't last forever. If I left this on the street and someone took it, it was gone. There's no record of it anywhere. The second thing was, if, if someone actually picked it up, how would they know what it was? There's no sign or tag or anything. So I decided to solve those problems in two ways. The first thing I thought is, I know, I'll take a picture. I'll leave the bottle on the street and then I'll take a picture of it. That way, if anyone can't be in the neighborhood of where it is, at least there'll be a picture for people to enjoy. That's a great idea. As well, people would be able to look at these pictures and hopefully try and find it. The second thing I did was I had decks of cards made for me. Now I had to do that because I needed to put words on one side, never give up, so people saw it, they'd know it was an inspirational message. And on the other side, I put the words send wonder. And I chose those words very specifically because they're not words that you see very often together, send and wonder. You don't really use those in a sentence. But that way, if people typed those words into a search engine, they would come up to my result, which would explain what it was. And I called it the send wonder campaign. I also called it the send wonder campaign as a tribute to Banksy. He has that famous picture of a rebel throwing flowers, and I really felt like a rebel sending wonder. <laughs> and that's how the Send Wonder campaign was born. I decided to start with 100 bottles, one a day for 100 days. I would leave them on the street, take a picture. People could go try and find it, and we'll see how it goes. And I remember the very first one. I was so excited. I put it on an electrical box, and I hid around the corner waiting to see if anyone would grab it. And sure enough, within one minute, 
A homeless man walks up, grabs it, puts it in his pocket, doesn't even look at it. <laughs> I was devastated. But this was a lesson, an integral lesson, because who am I to judge that guy? Who am I to judge if he goes home and be inspired by that? If I'm going to be a real artist, I'm going to leave that on the street and not look back. The next day, however, I left it on top of a mountain, just saying. <laughs> and so it continued, one bottle a day for 100 days. I left one on a dirt road in front of our beautiful library. I even hung them from signs. And by about day 50, about halfway through the Send Wonder campaign, when I put this picture up, several dozen people would be actively searching for this bottle. But that wasn't the only amazing thing. It wasn't amazing the number of people looking for a bottle, but the number of people who wanted to leave a bottle. <coughs> I started getting emails, dozens of emails every day from people all over the world who were contacting me specifically to help. They had a desire to take part in my art. And this is where I learned that random acts of kindness are a complete waste of time. Hear me out. If you're in a parking lot and you see a pregnant lady stumbling with groceries, having a hard time, it makes sense to offer to help. But you shouldn't be seeing that lady randomly. You should be searching her out. You should be scanning the parking lot for people to help. If you go into a coffee shop and there's someone outside that needs a coffee, buy it for him or her. Kindness must have focus. It also takes practice. You got to do it often. You have to train your kindness. Just like you don't go into the gym and pull weights at random. Your kindness should have a purpose. Kindness with focus, direction, and intent. With that in mind, I started leaving the bottle not in random places, but specific places. I made a list. I thought, I need a bottle in China. And a great friend of mine, Vincent, he was going to China. This is what kindness does. He did that for me. I want to take a picture with an airplane in the photo. Specifically, I wanted an airplane. I stood there for hours. <laughs> I finally got it. I wanted to leave a deck of cards in a bottle in a forest. I love that idea. A deck of cards in a bottle in a forest. Left there, not at random, but on purpose. And then we get to this man. And do you know where this photo was taken? It was taken in Atlanta, Georgia. Several blocks from where I am standing right now. A friend of mine, Dodd, asked if he could drop a bottle for me. And when I had the distinct honor from Emory to come here and speak today, I got chills. I'm getting chills right now. <laughs> we have come full circle. We are right in the middle of it. Okay, before we get to him, then let me say that the Send Wonder campaign never stopped. Those first hundred bottles came and went, but they just gave me a taste of my new addiction. I still leave bottles to this day. I still use regular decks of cards now. I'm fairly Googleable, so there's no need for special decks of cards. And I leave them all the time. This was a few weeks ago. If you're going to go look for that, it might be hard to find. <laughs> uh, this was before we flew here. I just love the idea of blue deck on a red table. That was a, such a hard photo to take. You have no idea. You have no idea how hard that photo was. Uh, this one was just a few hours ago up on that balcony. But my favorite so far is still this man. And I'll tell you why. Because I never get to meet the people that find the bottles. I never get to really talk to them. But my friend who left that bottle for me here, he stayed around and talked to this man. And do you know where he was the day before this photo was taken? Prison. Here is a man who was in prison the day before, and he finds a bottle. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's not a million dollars or a new car, but it's something. And his look, it spoke to me. It still speaks to me. It says, do I really get to keep this? 
Why? And that's the question. Why? Why? Why did I leave that bottle for him? I wanted to do something nice. And his look, while questioning, it has a tone of happiness. He's smiling. I made someone who I have never met in my life happy. And with that, he pushed me to my new height. And it wasn't inspiration, that thing we're all looking for, that did it. It was a simple act of kindness. And that's the trick. This is where you get to look behind the curtain a little bit, because I truly believe that kindness is inspiration. They are the exact same thing. And the act of being kind to someone, of inspiring them, I mean, if you can change a person's outlook, if only for a moment, they will teach you something about yourself. So now the question becomes, not how do I inspire, how do I find inspiration, but how, in real life, can I be kind to someone? And you don't have to leave decks of cards and bottles, give them to people. It can be as simple as the next person you see saying, hey, I am loving that hat. <laughs> now before you say, I just sat through 10 minutes to learn, I'm supposed to tell people I like their hat, let me leave you with this. It is a spark that will set the fire in you. You don't have to set things ablaze. You just got to get the fire started. And all it takes is the smallest of sparks. So when I leave here, compliment the person sitting next to you. Be fearless. Don't make it random. Find someone. Be kind. Send wonder. You don't have to be an artist to do this. The only thing you need is to make an effort. I hope you've appreciated mine. Thank you. <laughs>